What's up, guys? Really glad to have you here with us for Fourth of July weekend. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm not here a whole lot. My name's Jonathan. I'm the campus pastor for our location in Anne Arundel County. We meet at Arundel High. They're holding it down right now. And I'm excited to be here with you. Fourth of July weekend is a big weekend for me and my family because today is actually me and my wife's six-year wedding anniversary, which is great. So far, so good. Yeah. But this weekend, that's not even like the big thing we're celebrating because this weekend we are unveiling to people, I'm excited to share with you, that we are expecting a baby girl this November. Yeah. We did it. We made it happen. All right. Really excited. And it's been a really fun journey getting to see my wife grow as a mom and kind of deal with all the things that happen with pregnancy. Uh, fellas, you just don't even know until you know. And to get myself ready, I decided, hey, I want to serve in the Mosaic one-year-old pre-K room. <laughs> so I did it two weeks ago, and I know I don't know, okay? I don't need any of you to educate me on, like, how much I don't know. I know I don't know. Because when I went to serve after the huddle, they're like, does anybody have any questions? And I was like, yeah, how do we, like, walk them to the bathroom? And they go, they poop their diapers. <laughs> and I didn't know I was stepping into a diaper situation. So I have a lot to learn clearly. And there have been a lot of really fun memories along the way. We got to go to the sonogram where we saw the baby like kicking and moving and she did this thing with like her hand like a Vogue and she held her index finger and I was like proud of her. I was like, that's my girl. I don't even know what she's doing but she just held it out and I was really pumped. <laughs> but one of my favorite things about this whole season so far was getting to tell my parents because my wife and I were overjoyed when we found out we were going to have a baby, but when we got to tell my folks, I knew they were going to lose their minds. And if you don't know my family, you should know they're, we are a little over the top. There's a lot of personality with my family. So we decided we were going to tell them, we found out right before my dad's 60th birthday. So we got him a card that said, happy birthday, grandpa, because he's old. And we were like... <laughs> You know, he's not going to pay attention to that. But then on the inside, we made it say, yeah, you read that right, to indicate that he, in fact, was going to be a grandfather. And it was like a bomb went off in my living room. And I wanted to try to capture it for you and articulate what it was like. And I just can't do it without showing you exactly what happened. So check out this video. Happy birthday, Grandpa. Oh. Uh, what? Yeah! <laughs> is insane, and I love them, and my mom is never that animated in her life. She's never made that noise before. But after we found out we were going to have a baby, we knew we have to come up with how do we tell people. You know, that's like the first thing when you find out you have a kid, like, all right, how do we get it out there? And we decided we weren't going to do some big social media push. That was something that we decided, but that meant we had to get really intentional about how do you tell people about this good news that you have. So we crafted it, and we made a list of who are all the people we really want to tell face-to-face -face or on the phone or all that stuff. So then we did that, and that was great. But then we found out the gender, and somebody just couldn't keep it to themselves and just may or may not have told like a dozen people within 24 hours what the gender was, which meant that people we wanted to talk to face-to-face -to -face found out other ways, because inherently, you know, this good news spreads. And it was really hard for us, my wife and I had conflict about this, because I was stupid, but also <laughs> because we didn't have a plan and we didn't get to really get this news out there the way we wanted, ultimately what happened was people found out the good news in the wrong way. People heard about this good thing, and guys, our news didn't change but they found out about it in a manner that wasn't what we wanted. It wasn't the right way to communicate it. Our good news got shared in the wrong way. And that's actually a tension that I want us to step into today because that happens for us as a church. The church has good news. 
The church has news about God and about our humanity and that because of Jesus, our brokenness is not the final word on our lives, but so often joy and good news is not what people think of when they think about church. For some of you in this room, when you got told about the good news of Jesus, you got brought into church and instead of being encouraged and and engaged and cared for, you got worn out, beat down and told that you had to wear your absolute best clothes on Sunday because you can't come to God as you are. Or you heard about the good news of Jesus, but then as you got close to the person that invited you, you realized all they really care about is that you vote the way they want them to vote. Or maybe you heard about the good news of Jesus, but as you got close to that person who said that they knew it and they lived it, instead of seeing humility and compassion, you saw haughtiness and self-righteousness. But we have good news as a church. The news about Jesus is good, but the way we communicate it matters a whole lot. And that's what I want us to talk about today. And if you're new here, if you're a first timer, man, we're so glad you're here. You are welcome. But I want you to stay with me because this conversation today is not housekeeping for the church. It's not just talking about two church people and you're going to be off to the side. I want you to stay with me because we're going to have a dialogue about this good news and what does it mean for you and why is it that if the person that invited you is with you today or no matter who invited you. If they, if they did it for the right reasons, it's not because they want something from you, it's because they want something for you. And that's what we're going to get into today. For the last three weeks, we've been in this series laying bricks. We've been laying the foundational core values of who we are as a church, and we've been doing that by going through Psalm 23. And today, we're going to pick up in verse 4 of Psalm 23, and it's going to be a little interesting because this is one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. There's even a good chance that you've heard about this Uh, in the movies before, but as we look at this, there's some ramifications for your life of not just what it means for you in the context of this good news, but what does it mean for us as people that we share it. So week one, we talked about what does it mean to have endless second chances because of Jesus. Week two, we talked about being rooted in truth, doing what's hard for us because God's word tells it to because God's word leads to the best life possible. Last week, as Jeff said, we talked about owning your growth, And then today, we're going to talk about that final, not final, but the next value that enables us to make sure that sharing the good news is not just something that benefits other people, it's something that helps our own growth in the process. So let's get into it. Let's review Psalm 23 real quick. Verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then here's the verse we're going to land on today. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now this psalm was written by King David. He was a man appointed by God to be the king of the Israelites. And he wrote this psalm, and in verse 4, you'll notice there is a dramatic dark turn. Psalm goes, or, sorry, David goes from writing about still waters and green pastures, and then all of a sudden he's like, I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. That is a significant turn, and this is imprecise language that actually speaks to our lives now. It's poetry that David wrote to capture something that's true for all of us. So I want to go phrase by phrase and look at the poetry of this. The first thing you're going to notice is that he says, even though I walk through the valley. And this is significant because David is saying that The valley of the shadow of death is not his dwelling place. This is not his destination. David says, I walk through the valley. And the word valley here is so important because in Hebrew time, the valley was not a phrase used to talk about being in a good spot. David was a shepherd, then he was a soldier, and then he was king. And in combat, you don't want to be in the valley. When you're in the valley, your obstacle or your enemy is above you. You're in a disadvantaged, vulnerable place. So in this poetic language, David is saying that he is passing through, it's not his destination, he's passing through a lowly, vulnerable place, that's the valley. And then he puts an identifier on the valley, and he calls it the valley of the shadow of death. And this is why I think his writing is so brilliant. Think about shadows. When you picture a shadow, when you picture the institution of shadows, what emotions or imagery come to mind? Darkness, it's, shadows are looming, they're ominous. I mean, I've seen YouTube videos of little kids who are scared of their own shadows. Shadows aren't, don't have this happy presence in your life. But the thing about a shadow is, it's there, but you can't grasp it. 
Shadows are intangible, but they're cast by something that is tangible. A shadow itself can't hurt you, but the thing that casts the shadow can hurt you. And David is saying he's passing through this vulnerable place, and the shadow of death is upon him. And if you've ever had a shadow come across you, like land on you, or when you walk, you realize you're in the shadow, it's only there because it's close. So David is in this vulnerable place where the shadow of death is near to him, But then he keeps going, and before we see how he wraps it up, it's important to note that in this tension we've just established in this poetic language, David is capturing the struggle of life. He's capturing what you and I experience. And for you, you may not need poetry to help you see your life as a valley of the shadow of death. You live it. It's the depression that you go to counseling and you take your pills and you you talk to people to help you get through it, but then sometimes in some season that depression comes in waves and you are reminded that there's this thing that is completely out of your control that messes with you. Or maybe the valley you're in is the baggage from a relationship that built up all these insecurities in yourself and even though that ended five years ago, it still affects your current relationship now. Or maybe because of illness or something going on with a family member, the valley of the shadow of death for you right now is the fact that one day we will all die. David, when he wrote this psalm, was not ignorant to the pain of life. But that's why what he says next is so significant for every one of us in this room. Because he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I'm there, he says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. He says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. David says, despite the shadow of death being upon him, he will not fear evil because the Lord, his shepherd, is close to him. And not only is the Lord near, but he's intimately close. Look at the intimacy of this statement. Guys, this is, when you break this down, when you look at scripture this analytically, you're, you're going to get so much out of it. In this chapter, in this verse, I'm sorry. This is the first time David refers to God in the second person throughout the entire chapter. David doesn't say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for he is with me. He says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. There's a a shift in how he's talking about God that, that represents an intimacy and an assurance and a significance of knowing that God is with him. And this phrasing indicates that God is close. And what that means for you is that if you are in the valley now, I hope you don't view God as being up on the mountain looking down at you and thinking, oh wow, I hope he or she gets through that pain. What this shows us is that God is with us. He is close to us in the middle of the valley. He's with you in the middle of the pain, encouraging you and egging you on to cling to him in this process. And David ends that the reason we can fear no evil is because the Lord is with him and his rod and staff, they comfort me. That's what he says here. And this is important because the rod and the staff were used by Hebrew shepherds. They were tools. And the rod is what got used to protect the flock from predators. And the staff was used to guide the shepherd along his own path and bring sheep back to himself that went astray. And you can visualize now the significance of God not just protecting you, but guiding you back to himself when you go astray. And that's why your rod and your staff, they comfort you. That's why it's so significant here. The rod and the staff... This imagery represents what we get to experience because of the gospel of Jesus. That because of the good news about Christ, no matter how many prescription meds you have to take, how many chemo sessions you have to sit through, how many probation hearings you have to get through to get out of your past, because of the good news of Christ, your circumstance is not the end of your story. Jesus has the last word on your story. And if you're in the valley, it's important to note here, the shepherd's presence doesn't eliminate all evil. It doesn't take away all the hardship in your life. The presence of the shepherd eliminates the fear of evil. And we have the opportunity here to not, doesn't mean you're never going to face evil, it means you don't have to be afraid of evil. Because Jesus Christ took the full reality of death. He took the penalty we deserve. He dealt with separation from God because of our sin. And because of him, we only have to deal with the shadow of death because Jesus took death in its entirety for us. And he says it in John 16, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And this is the good news. 
This is the good news about Jesus, that we can take heart in him because he has overcome the world. And if that's true, because we believe it is, if we know that it is not just possible to get through life, but to experience fullness of life through faith in Jesus, this is something people got to know. And so for many of us as Christians, we're like, yeah, I'm there. People got to know. We got to tell people. We got to do this thing. But how do I do that? How do I have a conversation about faith that doesn't want to make me throw up in my mouth or make someone else punch me in the face? How do I have a conversation and tell people about Jesus that doesn't make me sound like a ninth grader asking some girl out to homecoming when you're like, hey, um, you should, I mean, if you're not busy, maybe you should think about, you should come check out my church sometime. Bye. <laughs> like, because we just feel uncomfortable. And the way our culture goes, is it, it just becomes increasingly more awkward for us to have a dialogue about this thing because when you talk about Jesus, the first thing people get is defensive. And because we don't feel the urgency to do this or because we don't feel equipped to do it, we start to appropriate the excuses that we make and we start to tell ourselves, I, I don't really need to talk about Jesus here. I, even though this person's going through something that I related to, I'm not going to include the fact that my faith is the only thing that got me through it. Oh, yeah, they're lonely. I'm, I'm not going to mention the fact that I go to church every week and that I put on a connection card random things about myself and I know people pray about them and then I actually see fruit in my life. I'm not going to talk about that because that's just weird. And it's because of this awkwardness we feel. But what's true for all of us who follow Jesus today is that no excuse should ever jeopardize somebody else's eternity. No excuse you can make is good enough to jeopardize somebody else's opportunity to bump into Jesus. And that's why our fourth value in this series today is come and see. Our fourth value today is come and see. And come and see means that as a church, we are committed to participating in the greatest mission on earth so that everybody we know and care about can bump into Jesus. Come and see is our way of saying we want to share the good news about Christ. Now when it comes to talking to people about our faith, there are really two main excuses or mental roadblocks that get in the way. And I want to talk about both of them today. But the first one I want to tackle is this tension of how. Okay, John, you, you talked about this, Psalm 23, 4. This is a reality. I want to talk to, about people, I want to talk to people about this, but how do I do that? And that's why our value here is so significant, because the way we have conversations about our faith is by telling people, come and see. This, an this principle is actually the answer to how we talk to people about our faith. Throughout the New Testament, the number one way the message of Jesus got spread is when someone's soul gets restored. They get changed. Everything about them is rejuvenated by bumping into Jesus, and then that person goes and tells other people about what Jesus did in their life, and they just say, hey, come and see this Jesus guy. In John 9, there's a blind beggar, and the, the whole town knows about him. And he's got this reputation, and then Jesus and his posse come along, and without making any big announcement, Jesus spits in the dirt, he makes some mud, rubs it on the guy's eyeballs, and says, go wash yourself in a nearby pool. And then the blind guy does it, and he comes back, and he's fully healed. But no one believes that this is the same blind beggar, because he's been around forever. So they take him to the Pharisees, who are like the religious elitists of the day, and they start grilling him about his theology. Like, what do you know about Jesus? What is, is he perfect? Is he the son of God? What do you say about Jesus? And here's what he says. The guy says, listen, I don't know any of that. All I know is that I couldn't see, and I did exactly what this man told me to, and now I can see. So you got to come see this guy, Jesus. The longest conversation between Jesus and another human on this earth was between himself and the Samaritan woman, someone he should not have been talking to due to cultural standards. It was a Samaritan, and they had huge bad blood between the Jewish people and the Samaritans, and then two, it was a woman. And back then, that's not something a Jewish rabbi should have done, but in that conversation, Jesus knows and shows us that every single person on this planet has worth. And in that conversation, I can't go into the, all the specifics, but this woman's life is changed, and she believes he is the Messiah, the one who's going to redeem the whole world. And at the end of the story, there are all these Samaritans who had no business being around a Hebrew rabbi, but it says they all put their faith in him for two reasons. One, because they heard about what happened to this woman, and two, because she said, come and see this guy who changed my life. You don't believe me, just come and meet Jesus. And it says they came to put their faith in him because they encountered Jesus himself. We want, as a church, to be people who help others experience the grace and truth of Christ. And how do we do that? We say, come and see. Come and see is the easiest way for you to participate in this call of evangelism that Jesus gives us in Scripture. 
And come and see is the easiest way for you to do it because you don't have to be a gifted communicator. You don't have to be an expert in theology. You don't have to be able to communicate and articulate all the intricacies of Jesus being the substitutionary atonement for our sin. It's good to learn that stuff. But by you being able to say, come and see, it enables you to help people bump into the same Jesus that's changed your life. And ultimately, come and see means you invite them to mosaic with you to experience the gospel in the context of our community as he moves in and through us. And like I said before, it's important to be able to articulate what Jesus did for you. I'm passionate about that. I've led growth groups on that. I will lead more in the future. But being able to give a good gospel presentation is not the silver bullet to helping someone encounter Christ. Believe me, I tried. So if you're someone who's with me, if you're with me so far and you're like, yeah, I want to be better at telling people about my faith. I want to make it practical. I want to be able to do this well, but I still struggle with how. I want to give you three little bullet points that are going to help you live this out. But it all funds underneath the banner of this truth for you. Don't just know the gospel, show the gospel. If we're going to be a church that says, come and see, I don't want us to just know the gospel, I want us to show the gospel. And these three points I want to outline, uh, my hope is they help you do that more effectively. Because the people that are best at sharing their faith, the people who bring their friends to Mosaic a lot, they're not special. No offense to you guys who do it well. The people who are best at bringing their friends to Mosaic and sharing their faith, they're not special. They took a shot. They took a shot. And when you initiate with someone, what's true for you is that say you're hanging out and you go to happy hour or maybe you grab some cigars and you're hanging out and somehow faith comes up and there's a window to invite them to Mosaic. The reason they're going to accept an invitation to join you here or maybe accept an invitation to have a longer dialogue later, it's not because they trust God. It's not because they trust Jesus. If they're a millennial like me, they don't even trust institutions because Pluto's not even a planet anymore, so we can't <laughs> trust anybody. But they're not going to come to Mosaic and they're not going to have a dialogue about Jesus because they trust us as a church. They're going to do that because they trust you. And that's why it's so important for us to not just know the gospel, but show the gospel. If you're here as a first timer or you're still new figuring this out, there's a good chance that the person who invited you, you're here because you trusted them. Not because you did all this research and looked at our theology and looked at our staff or what we do and decided you trusted us. It's because you trusted the person who brought you here. And listen, if the people in your life knew they needed Jesus, they'd be here. They'd be asking you questions already. And sometimes that happens. Last week at Mosaic Arundel, we had a woman who I got to talk to. It was her first time. And I found out that she was there, a friend of hers who was there, who comes regularly, she told me, that she was there for the first time because she had gone through an awful tragedy that week. And I love that we have that reputation. She, she said to her friend, I know I could find hope here, so that's why I came. I love that reputation, but I don't want to bank on or wait for horrible things to happen to people in order for them to bump into Jesus. And that's why we got to say, come and see. And with this value being so practical and immediate in your life, you can live this out this afternoon. Because it's so practical, that's why we got to spend some time breaking this down in a way that you can live out later in the week. So this isn't just something that makes you feel good on a Sunday, but it's something you can live out six months from now. So here are the three practical points. The first one, when it comes to sharing your faith, is we need to flex it. Last night, I had like bodybuilders in the front row, and they were like, yeah, flex it. And I was like, stop it. <laughs> but when I say flex it, what it means is show people your faith and let them know that it's functional. Don't wait for something terrible to happen and then you finally bring up the fact that Jesus is a part of your life. Look for opportunities to talk about your faith in a way that makes sense. I've said in another message before that we've got to make it make sense. If you've been friends with someone for two years and in year two you bring up the fact that Jesus is a priority for you, you've inevitably lost credibility because if it really was important, you would have brought it up already. We've got to make it make sense, and we've got to look for opportunities to flex our faith and show that it's functional. We've got to look for chances to say things like, oh yeah, my faith actually really helped me through this thing that I was dealing with that I told you about. Or when something at work comes up and it reminds you of, of something we talked about in a message, don't be afraid to say, oh, you know what, the thing we talked about with our team, that reminded me of something we discussed at our serving team at Mosaic, the church I go to. Because if you don't establish that your faith in Jesus and church is a part of your life, it's not going to make any sense later on. And that's why we uh, need to be people that flex our faith. And really, the big reason for that is because when you get invited to happy hour, or when you show up at the Raven's tailgate decked out in gear, or when you go ball out on the basketball court and show that you can give and take some smack talk, 
they're going to remember that you're a Christian and totally normal. And that's not something that people put two and two together right now. But when you have a chance to, to establish that you have functional faith that makes a difference in those moments when God supernaturally moves on your behalf and enables you to have an opportunity to say, come and see. So the first thing we got to do is flex it. The second one is know the dress code. Know the dress code. Have you ever been somewhere where you were just way overdressed and like you were uncomfortable about how overdressed you were? My wife and I went to a wedding a while back, and for a wedding, for me, it's a suit and, and shoes. My wife, it's a dress and some heels. And we show up, and we saw the father of the bride wearing boat shoes, khakis, and a polo. And we knew, oh boy, like we are way overdressed for this thing. And we were just a little uncomfortable by it. But the reason it happened is because we didn't know the dress code. And when it comes to our conversation today, what I mean is when it comes to saying come and see, we got to know the dress code, meaning we shouldn't try to shove an elaborate gospel conversation into a one-minute conversation. It's important to look for the opportunities to talk about Jesus, but we shouldn't feel the pressure to get the whole gospel out as a whole in every single glimpse or opportunity that happens. Sometimes we will get the chance to give a 5, 10, or 15-minute presentation about our life and what we understand about Christ and what he's been doing in our lives, but trying to shove a 10-minute dialogue into a 30-second elevator ride is like wearing a tuxedo to Mission Barbecue. It's not the right time or place. I'm sorry. And what if your mindset shifted? What if instead of waiting for a 10 or 15 minute opportunity to pop up that's going to happen once a year, you look to capitalize on those hundreds of little one to two minute interactions that you have throughout the week? How much more effective could we be in sharing our faith if we tried to capitalize on those little moments instead of just praying and banking on that one big one you get every 10 months? We've got to know the dress code. And the last step is don't forget the follow through. Don't forget the follow-through. If you play basketball, and I'm not very good, so don't hear me making these basketball references and thinking I'm any good. But if you talk to coaches, they'll tell you, you can have a wide open look, you can take a good shot, you can jump, you can have a good point of release, but if you don't follow through, there's a good chance that ball's not going to go in. And the greatest shooter in NBA history already, it's Steph Curry. I mean, even if you don't like the Warriors, he's already the best shooter of all time based on all the statistics. And he's got this weird shot where when he shoots, he kind of shoots it and pulls his hands back down. It's a little weird. But if you actually look at the photographs that capture his moment of release, he's always fully extended on his follow-through. The best shooters in NBA history always hold out the follow-through. Even when you're hanging out with your friends and you're like, Kobe, you always hold out the (laughs) follow-through. And then you brick like me and it's fine. But when we take a shot, like I said, the people who are good at sharing their faith, it's because they take a shot. The people who see real fruit in those relationships, it's not just because they took a shot, it's because they were tenacious about the follow through. That when you invite someone to come and see at Mosaic to experience the gospel, you're not just happy with the shot you took, you're focused on the follow through. When they say yes to coming on a Sunday, are you texting them Saturday night saying, can't wait to see you? Are you initiating with them saying, hey, I could pick you up tomorrow? Are you saying, hey, let's go grab drinks or go grab some food after service? What are you doing for the follow-up that's going to make sure that you're not just trying to get them to Mosaic, you're trying to get them to Jesus? We are not concerned about getting someone to come to a service. We want them to meet a Savior. And the follow-through is a great way to know, am I doing what it takes to make sure my friend fully gets a chance to hear and experience the gospel? So we can't forget the follow-through. And listen... I don't want us to be known as religious extremists. I want us to be relational evangelists. And people may call me a religious extremist because I say Jesus is the only way, but I just say that because Jesus said that. And if someone calls me that, I can't control it. But my goal is to be a relational evangelist. And the way I see it for all of us is we have a chance in our relationships to build a bridge between their heart and our heart so that Jesus can walk across it in God's supernatural timing to grow and show them the gospel, not just know the gospel, but build a bridge so that when that moment arrives, Jesus can actually walk across, that we might build equity with people so that they trust us when that opportunity comes. And we need to show the gospel, not just know the gospel, because we need them to see, because we have endless second chances, we don't hold grudges, we show grace. Because we're rooted in truth, we don't see the Bible as something that binds us, it's the word of God that leads to the best life possible. That because Jesus meets us in the middle of our valley when we are at our worst, when we see someone else at their worst, we don't run away, we run into the mess. And come and see, listen, come and see isn't about earning spiritual points in heaven. It's about making sure the people in your life that you care about 
encounter a life-changing relationship with God. Memorizing a gospel presentation alone won't produce salvation in someone's life. You've got to get close. You've got to get personal and help them experience what he's doing in your life so that when you say come and see, it actually means something. And I said at the start that there are two excuses that keep us from saying come and see. The first one is how. I don't know how. How do I do this? But the second one, if we don't address it, it will become the reason Mosaic stops making an impact in the future. And that excuse is that we just don't care. It may not be because you don't know how. It may be because you don't care. If you're anything like me, you like watching documentaries. I'm a big documentary guy. I probably watch more documentaries than any other type of movie genre or anything like that. And if you are like me, when you watch a documentary afterwards, you're like, everything is wrong. <laughs> Nobody knows. we got to change everything. And you want to talk to people about it, and you realize everything has sugar, and you can't eat McDonald's, and we don't even have money anymore. It's just paper. We're printing stuff. I only watched that one. All right. <laughs> I maybe don't even know what that means, money guys. But you watch a documentary, and you're like, everybody's got to know. So you talk to people about it. You've like, you got to go watch this one. You've got to watch this one. But then if you're like me, six months later, nothing's different. You're still eating McDonald's late at night, guilty. You're still eating food that's loaded with sugar, and you're still handling your money the same way you used to. And it's not because what you learned isn't true. It's because for every single one of us, new information doesn't lead to transformation. Information alone doesn't lead to transformation. Just because you know something new doesn't mean you inherently care enough to do something about it. Listen, 20, 25, 40 years of passivity or ignorance on a certain issue isn't going to be nullified in a 90-minute documentary. And when it comes to sharing our faith, just because we have information about Jesus doesn't mean that we are being actively transformed by that information. And what happens is we have this info, we keep it to ourselves, and ultimately we don't share because we don't care. The reason I don't talk about the stuff from or change my life from those documentaries is not because I don't know the right info, it's just I don't care enough. And for some of us, the brutal, honest truth is not that you don't know how to say come and see, it's you don't care to do it. You're lukewarm and you're loving it. And I'm not talking at you or putting you down, I'm talking with you because this is something I deal with. But the key to saying come and see and sharing your faith is understanding that a life with Jesus is infinitely better than anything someone could possibly experience apart from him. And if you aren't sold on that reality yet, it's because you don't get how good God's grace is. And if you're hearing me and you're a Christian and you feel uncomfortable and you feel bad about yourself, I want you to know that's a good thing. I'm not sorry. It's called conviction, and God uses it to move you and shape you and mold you into the person he wants you to be. And hear me on this. I've said it before. Saying come and see is not about increasing your standing with God. So don't think that I'm saying that. But saying come and see or not doing so does affect your obedience to God. And the beauty of all this is that you could live your life and not share the gospel with a single person but say, Jesus is my rock, he's my hope, he's my savior, and God will look down on you and say, I love you, I'm with you. Saying come and see and telling people about Jesus is not about you earning points with God. It's about you helping other people encounter him in a way that changed their life. And in just a moment, we're gonna celebrate that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make him love you less by taking communion. We're going to pass a tray down your row with a stack of cups. One's going to have a cracker. The other will have some juice, and that represents Jesus' body and his blood. And if you follow Jesus, I want you to take that stack and eat and drink it and not just think about what Jesus did for you, but think about the fact that you are having communion, community with God in that moment, and there's people in your life you care about that don't know grace is free and it's available and it can change everything for them. But we don't share because we don't care. It's not that you don't know how, it's not that you don't know who to talk to. It's that the gospel is just information for you and it hasn't led to transformation yet. And if that's you, I want nothing more for you right now than to get how good God's grace is because it is not too good to be true. We are all sinners. 
were born into sin and we were going to go back into sin if it wasn't for the atoning sacrifice of Jesus to break the cycle. And without Jesus, you've got sin here, and you've got sin here, and you've got sin here, and there's nothing you can do to earn your way to God. You can't good your way to God. It doesn't matter how many Bible verses you know, how many sermons you listen to, how many songs you listen to, how many times you come to church, because without Jesus, you got nothing. But with Jesus, because of the good news, God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus to meet you and meet us in the middle of our mess so that through grace we would be saved and we would never be the same again. And this is not too good to be true. This is our God. This isn't do good, get good. This is Jesus loved you, so you get Jesus. And when we talk about saying come and see, it's not about an empty religious phrase. It's about pointing people to the empty tomb and saying that is real. That's the goodness of grace. The reason we're so passionate about this, the reason I'm so passionate about this, and I'm not perfect at this, please don't think that I am the pillar of living this out. I just happened to spend 30 hours studying this and working on this and coming up with something that I thought was worth sharing. But the reason this matters is because what we get saved into is so much greater than what we get saved from. It's eternal life. It's not fire insurance when you die. It's life to the full now. And if you're not there with me yet, if you still believe Jesus is who he says he is and you don't care, I don't want you to fake it. I just want you to get grace. Because when you understand the goodness of God's grace, you can't keep it to yourself. Because when we understand grace, we say, come and see. And that's why our value is come and see. Come and see this Jesus who's changed my life. I don't have all the answers but I know the one who does. Let's pray. God, when we invite people, if we are more concerned about getting them to a service and experiencing something fun and cool, God, we repent of that and we pray that you would help our hearts care deeper, deeper for them than just helping them come to this thing that we like. But God, really, we care about this because we want people to bump into you and know you. So Jesus, we pray that you would make this something that sticks, that doesn't make us feel like, okay, yeah, we got to do something, but it would actually have fruit that lasts long after our memories of this message fades, and that we would embrace lifestyles where we show the functionality of our faith for the purpose of helping our people and helping our friends encounter you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.